there's a lot more going on here than you might think. Hmm. Today, we're going to talk about double attacks. It's like two for the price of one, and I bet your parents are all about some sales. In this position, White could of course just capture this pawn, Ow. and that would be great, but we're going for something more. What we want to do is attack two of Black's big pieces at the same time. <gasps> and a little hint today, it's usually going to be a good idea to look for pieces that are not defended. For instance, this rook. Hey. What's guarding that rook? Well, nothing. Oh. It's not hanging yet, but it will be soon. Oh, no. I would advise you not to focus on things like this pawn. This pawn is being defended several times. If it has two defenders, you would actually need three attackers just to consider capturing it. So, when you're focusing on double attacks, you'd like to look for pieces that are not defended. A double attack is just aiming at two pieces with one. I've got a really good move here for white. Let's have white travel up with his queen to the square d3. What are we double attacking? Well, the rook of course, but also don't forget the king. And if you aim at the king, it doesn't matter if he's defended because he always has to get himself out of check. When black blocks the check, I think that's one of his only ways to do so, then we simply capture the rook for free. Oof. Notice black did not have time to save his rook because he was required to get out of check. That's the beauty of the double attack. There were some other ways that white could have made a double attack here, but I don't think he has any other good double attacks with the queen. For instance, if you try to move your queen to the square a4, that kind of looks good, doesn't it? You're attacking the rook and the bishop. But black actually has several good responses. Huh. Black could miraculously save all of his friends with the move rook to b7. And of course, you don't want to capture the bishop, because if you do, the rook's going to come over and get you. And we learned the queen is worth 9 points, and the bishop is only worth 3. So white's actually losing 6 points. Same thing with capturing the knight. The rook is there for backup. We have one attacker and we have one defender. That means we should not be capturing. You need more attackers than defenders. Now some of you are yelling at your screen right now because you noticed there's actually an even better move. This rook, instead of guarding the bishop, could come all the way down to the square b1 and white is in check. Once he puts his queen and his rook in the way, they're both going to get captured and we have ourselves a back rank checkmate. Something we saw many videos ago, a very common way to lose a game if you're not careful. Going back to the beginning position, double attacks are even stronger when they include a check because black has to get his king out of danger. There was one more good double attack in this position. It involves the rook. Pause your videos and figure out where could the white rook move to aim at two black pieces at once. You probably found the move rook to c7, and of course it helps a lot that neither the knight nor the bishop have a defender. If the bishop moves, we take the knight, and if the knight moves, we take the bishop. That's pretty simple. I'd like to show you one more example of double attack. In this very common opening position, I like this move knight to e4. We usually don't move pieces twice in the opening, but we're setting up a very sneaky double attack. White often captures the Black Knight, and when Black captures back, what I've seen a lot of players do here is move this pawn to the square e3. That helps the bishop get out, it even helps the knight get out. But remember what I told you a few minutes ago? When pieces are not defended, often double attacks happen to those pieces. Take a look at this bishop up here on g5. He's kind of all by himself, isn't he? We also said that you should always be looking to attack the king. Double attacks are the strongest when they also involve a check. So you see my two red squares, the bishop and the king. Pause your videos, find a move for black. How can black make a double attack? This super sneaky move, queen to a5. She's traveling to the left but she's aiming at the king and the bishop, both of which are on the right side of the board. When white gets his king out of check, it doesn't matter how he does it, the queen will swoop over and capture a free bishop. Ooh. In fact, this exact same idea has been used to win many chess games. 
This is another very common chess position where black often brings the knight out to aim with this pawn. Now it looks like that pawn is hanging and it would not be a bad idea if white simply defended the pawn. I'm thinking of a move like pawn to d3. That's a very good move and a very reasonable move. But white can actually set a really sneaky trap. Let's have white pretend he doesn't see his pawns in danger and just allows black to capture it. When the knight captures, what's guarding this knight? That's right, nothing. And we said to always focus on the king, didn't we? Find a way for white to aim at the king and the knight at the same time. Hmm. Well, we're gonna use that same idea that black just used. This time we're gonna use it against black. Queen to a4 check. Yeah. We're traveling to the left. We're aiming back to the right on the diagonal and on the rank. No matter what black does to get out of check, he's gonna block with something. Let's have him block with the bishop. But our queen's not going to stay there for long. Our queen's going to swoop over and capture this knight. I know we're bringing the queen out early, but if it's to get $3 off the chessboard, I would certainly do it. I would walk really far to get $3 in life. Okay, remember this idea. If you aim at two pieces with one, it's a double attack, and that's a great way to pick off the enemy pieces. What a mess. There are pieces everywhere. Today, we're going to talk about forking, which is a little bit like double attack. The only difference is forking is usually done by knights and sometimes pawns. Hello. It kind of depends on who you ask. In this chess position, don't forget that white's pawns are traveling up the screen. After all, they did start on the number two. Let's focus on the one white pawn that I gave him. How can that white pawn aim at two black pieces at once? Well, this is surely the easiest question you're gonna get today because there's only one move that pawn can make and when we go to the square g6, we're aiming at both black knights. A chess master would say that we are forking the knights. If you were to also say that we are double attacking the knights, well, that'd be right also. Let's go back though. A true fork always uses a knight. Where can white move his knight to aim at the entire black army? Well, I wouldn't go to the square e5. If you went there, there's actually two attackers. One, two, and only one white piece is defending, and we know two against one by now is not good for the side with one. Instead, I'm sure you found the correct move, which also, by the way, happens to be a move in the center of the board. Remember how we said how strong knights can be in the middle? When the knight goes to d4, we're aiming at practically every piece that black cares about. We're aiming at the king, the rook, the rook, and truthfully, we don't care about the rooks. We care about the queen. Just aiming at the king and the queen is enough. When black gets his king out of danger, I know we're going to capture that queen and we have $9 in our pocket that we didn't have a couple of seconds ago. There are a couple of other double attacks here. So just for review, you may have noticed the move rook to d3. That aims at the king and the queen. The other rook could of course go to the square d3 with similar results. Or this rook could capture on f5. That makes a double attack of the king and the knight. I'm not sure you want to capture the knight because it has a defender, but it does count as a fork. And also in this position, your bishop could come capture this Ow. pawn, which is a double attack of this rook and this knight. What I'd like to show you now are the most common knight forks that happen early on in a chess game. What I'm about to show you is almost certainly the most common fork in all of kids chess. If white plays the move knight to g5, black actually has some serious problems. There are two attackers on that pawn and I only see one defender. If black doesn't realize what's going on, maybe he brings his bishop off the back row. If I was white, I would not capture with the bishop, I'd capture with the knight because when you do so, you make a fork. You're aiming at the queen and you're aiming at the rook. Of course, he's gonna save his queen. And when he does, we capture the rook and look at there, we've already captured a rook and a pawn. Six extra points really early in the game. White usually goes on to win this one. If f7 is the most popular fork square on the right side of the board, then surely c7 is the most popular fork square on the left side. Notice nothing is guarding c7, and we all know by now, bad things happen to pieces that don't have friends. 
also noticed that Black's Queen is out in the open early. We've seen some dangers about that before. So the best move for White is to bring his knight to the square, d5. Which, by the way, is already 1 4. We're aiming at the queen, and we're aiming at the pawn. I know we're aiming at the bishop, but look how many defenders that bishop has. The king, both knights, and the queen. Whoa. I don't think we're going to be capturing that bishop anytime soon. If black doesn't realize what's going on and slides his queen over, then our knight takes this pawn, and it's a real fork of the king and the rook. The king must move, we capture the rook on the next turn. And just like before, we've got six extra points in our pocket really early in the game. Let's go back and let's see if we can figure out how to defend against a fork. If you were black here, where could you move your queen to also defend this pawn? Did you find the move queen to d6? I hope so. Now there's one attacker on the pawn, but there's one defender. And if it's one to one, the defending side is okay. Not every fork is going to win pieces. If you're defending, see if you can move one piece to guard the other, and you might just be able to get out of a fork. Well, chess kids, I couldn't let you go today without showing you my favorite fork puzzle. This is actually the end of a longer puzzle, but I only want to show you this part. It looks like black's doing better. Both sides have two pawns, but black has a rook against a knight. A rook is usually worth more than a knight, especially with all this open space. But Black has to move next, and I think you're realizing that he's got to move his rook. Well, it seems like any old square will do, but wait a minute, there aren't that many squares he can use. Mm -hmm. We're going to put a red box on every single square he can move to, and hopefully I can show you that every one is bad. If he goes to this square, the white pawn on a3 will capture him. If he goes to this square, the king will capture him. Same with this one. If he goes to this one or this one, the white knight will just take him right away. If he goes to this one or this one, same story, the knight will just capture him. Now that leaves a lot of possibilities remaining, but guess what? There's a fork at every turn. If we go to the square B3, let's go ahead and put the rook on that square so you can see it. Where can white move his knight to aim at the king and the rook? We have a fork on C5, you've got it. Black must move his king out of check. I would capture with my knight, and we won five points for free. Let's try again. What if the rook travels to the square b7? Well, it's the same answer. Knight to c5 forks the king and the rook. One more option remaining. The rook can travel to the square d5. Now, our knight travels to b6 and makes yet another fork. There's just no other move for that black rook. We didn't talk about f5, but I know you realize the pawn could just capture. There is simply no good rook move. What? Thanks to all of these knight forks, black is definitely going down. Hmm. Knights are the trickiest pieces to move in chess, kids. And if you can find a way for your knight to aim at two pieces at once, you'll be tricking your opponents and winning material in no time. Just like the fork you eat with. Stab two pieces at once, and you will never be hungry. We're going to talk about probably the most common tactic in chess. Mm -hmm. It's called a pin. You know, like when your teacher pins an assignment to the board? Well, today a pin is when two of the other team's pieces are in the same line. Take a look at Mr. King Hello. and Mr. Knight. They're on the same diagonal, and lucky for us, our bishop is on that diagonal. Now, what does a pin do? Well, it keeps the other person's piece from running away. In this chess position, if this knight tries to run away, the black king will be in check. That's against the rules, so we say the knight is pinned. If I try to move the knight, you're going to see the computer won't even let me do it. Since moving the knight is against the rules, we call it an absolute pin. It's absolutely not able to move, because the piece behind it would be the king. And we all know by now, it's against the rules to put your king in check. Do you see another absolute pin that white is doing to the black pieces? Hmm. Well, that would be the rook. Notice the king and the rook are also on the same diagonal, and, lucky for us, our queen's on that diagonal too. So this rook is absolutely pinned. He is stuck. Oh, no. He's like a wrestler when somebody else jumps on top of him. He's stuck to the mat. Here's your challenge, kids. I want you to make a pin. How about using the king and the queen? Pause your videos and figure out how white can do that. 
Well, here you actually had two answers. You could have used E the rook, so it's dealer's choice. Let's go ahead and pick this rook, moving the rook to E1. Notice we're putting our rook on the same line as the two black pieces. This queen is absolutely pinned. If she runs away, she'd be putting her own king in check. That's against the rules. And of course, white has a backup. If the queen takes the rook, we have this other rook that'll swoop over, and white is very happy to trade a rook for a queen. And you know by now, the queen is worth nine points, the rook is only five. That's a deal I'll make every day of the week and twice on Sunday. Next position. Okay, I'm gonna ask you to find another pin in this position. Pause your videos and have white play a dynamite move. Okay, you actually have to focus on the other person's pieces first. The king and the rook are on the same diagonal. We have a diagonal moving piece. That would be the bishop. The bishop travels up to h5, and this is very similar to the pin in the first position. If the rook tries to run away, that's against the rules. The computer won't even let me do it. Now the best try for black is to move his king to the square f7. I know it's tempting to capture that rook, but sometimes you've got to be a little bit more patient. Hold your horses, as some of my chess teachers say. If the bishop captures the rook, I know you're winning five points for three, but white only has one pawn left. And if the black king can step in front of it, you're gonna have to take my word for it. That's a draw. Let's go back. White had a better move here. Boys and girls, when you already have a pinned piece, you want to put pressure on the pinned piece. You're gonna hear me say that in a lot of videos. I'm gonna shorten it. Put PP on the PP. Put pressure on the pinned piece. I want you to pile up on that rook because he's stuck. We only have one piece we can do that with. That's our pawn. So our pawn lurches forward. The rook can't move. So black has to make a different move. And now when we capture the rook, the bishop has the backup of the pawn. This is a winning position. So boys and girls, don't always capture the pinned piece. Sometimes you want to put pressure on it. Next chess position. Now, white is in a pin, but this is not an absolute pin. We call this a relative pin. What that means is the knight usually shouldn't move, but it's not against the rules. When a piece is in a relative pin, there's a piece behind the pinned piece that's not a king, in this case, a queen. Moving the knight is usually bad. If I move the knight to d4, I'm gonna lose my queen. Well, that's not against the rules. You are allowed to give away your queen. Let's go back. There was a couple of ways that white could have gotten out of the pin. That's what we're gonna focus on here. The coolest move for white is knight to g5 check. Notice the power of check. Because black's king is in danger, he doesn't have time to take our queen. That's a very important difference. So the black king scoots out of the way. Not only does white get to save his queen, he gets to win a piece. She just comes up the board and captures the bishop. Let's go back. There's another common way to get out of a pin. In this position, you can advance your pawn to h3, and if the bishop tries to go to h5 to keep the pin, white can play this cool move g4, and the pin is now blocked. In fact, the bishop is trapped. So white went from a pinned knight to winning a piece. That's a pretty good turnaround. Got one more position I wanna look at today. In this position, what I want to show you is that when a piece is pinned, it's not doing the job that it looks like it's doing. Huh. Let's start off by figuring out which one of Black's pieces is pinned. Well, it's not that easy to see. You have to look at the entire board. It's this pawn. What? Did you notice this bishop coming all the way down the diagonal and pinning the pawn? That pawn is in an absolute pin. The reason we call it absolute is because the piece behind it is the king. So it's absolutely not able to move. Even though it looks like this pawn is guarding the other pawn, what you have to remind yourself is that a pinned piece does not protect. And our queen can travel all the way up the board and capture this pawn. It looks like a bad move, but remember the pawn can't take, it's in an absolute pin. The king has to scoot sideways, and now we get to play our favorite checkmate, the queen and helper mate, which I know you already know about. The queen sits on top of the king, the bishop is the helper, and because we know about pins, we're able to execute a checkmate. Let's review the key ideas. When two of the other team's pieces are on the same line, look to make a pin. 
your queen, your bishop, and your rook can all make pins. If a piece is pinned to the king, it's an absolute pin. Otherwise, it's a relative pin. Just because you're in a pin doesn't mean you can't get out. And also, when a piece is pinned, it's not doing the job that it looks like it's doing. Oh, and don't forget, put PP on the PP and you'll be the pin master. If you've mastered pins, then skewers are going to be no problem. What's a skewer? Well, no, it's not that thing you put on the grill in the summertime. That's a skewer, but not in the chess sense. There's going to be no chicken or shrimp today. A skewer in chess is when two pieces are on the same line. Now, how is that different than a pin? Hmm. Well, during a skewer, the opponent's more important piece is in front. In this position, let's take a look at two black pieces that are on the same line. Let's pick out the queen and the king. They're both on the fifth rank. Hi. And if we extend that arrow all the way over, you'll remember from our pin lesson how strong of a move rook to h5 is. Unlike a pin where the front piece can't move, when there's a skewer, the front piece has to move. The front piece is actually the more important piece. In this position, the king is required to move, that's the rules of chess, and we get the queen behind Ow. the king. Let's try another skewer from our opening position. Let's take a look at the king and the rook. They're on the same diagonal. I'm gonna extend my arrow all the way down the board. Is there a diagonal piece that white can put on that diagonal? Hmm. Well, there sure is. The bishop can travel to the Jack. square F3. The king has to move, and when he does, we will get the treasure hiding behind the king. The queen could have also done the trick. She could have traveled to the square H1. That's a skewer of the king and the rook. She could have even traveled to the square G2, which is a super fancy move. Not only are we skewering the king and the rook, we're also making a double attack of the king and the knight. Really fancy combining tactics. Let's go back. Were there any other skewers that white could have made? Well, I like the move bishop to b3. Check. That's a pretty good move. The king uh -huh. is in check, and when he moves, we will pick off the knight. Notice black could capture the bishop, but we do have backup in the form of our rook. Yo. One final skewer that I would not advise you to play would be the move queen to a2. Check. Although we are skewering the king and the knight, we're going to lose our queen on the very next turn after queen takes queen. Once again, a skewer is like a pin, except the more important piece is in front, but it's largely the same idea. Let's move on to our next position. Fans of chess movies might recognize the idea. If you've ever seen the movie Searching for Bobby Fischer, the little boy Josh Whiteskin wins in much the same way I'm about to show you. Now, it's Black's move first, even though Josh was white, and Black played the move A5. It looks like a pawn race. Who's going to win? Josh played h4, and the race was on. Here they go. Who's going to get a touchdown first? And Black scores with a queen. It seems like Black should win. Black got his queen first. But the funny thing is, Josh got a queen on the next turn, and he immediately skewered the Black king and the Black queen. Black's king had to move out of the way, and White's queen swooped all the way down and captured Ow. Black's queen and Black gave up on the very next move. Now that's not how the game ends in real life, but hey, that's Hollywood for you. Let's move on to one final chess position. I'm going to really challenge you with this one. You have to use your powers of pins and forks to get it right. Now in our starting position, you might think a move like bishop c4 is a pretty good one because you're kind of pinning the black bishop. It can't travel along this way, but you know what it can do? It can travel this way, and that would just be a bishop for bishop trade. Nothing special there. Instead, what I'd like to do is look at a different first move. So that's back up. Instead of playing bishop c4, we have this amazing move rook takes bishop. Ow. Now we are losing five mm. points for three, but don't worry, there is a method to my madness. Let's say black takes back with his queen. Ow. Now we have the king and queen on the same diagonal. Our move bishop c4 is suddenly the right move. There's no way that black can save his queen. She is in an absolute pin. She could of course capture your bishop, Ow. but when you take back, white has a bunch of extra pawns and white should go on to win this one. Let's go back again because you're probably realizing that after rook takes e6, 
Black did not have to take back with his queen. He could have taken back with his king. Ow. But wait a minute, are the king and queen still on the same diagonal? Well, they are, but it's a different diagonal. This time, it extends all the way to h3, and our bishop can just as easily move there. This time, we have a skewer, because the more important piece is in front. In fact, the skewer is even stronger than the pin, because when the king moves out of the way, and we take the queen, it doesn't even cost us a bishop. So pin and skewer are largely the same thing, but skewer is when the more important piece is in front. Either way, they're both very dynamic tactics that you should add to your arsenal.